So thank you for coming. Welcome to session three of FileMaker Group Therapy. It's nice to see you all again. Today's topic is the Anchor Buoy Graph Management Strategy. On our agenda for today is first a discussion, why do we need to manage the relationship graph in our FileMaker databases? And then secondly, the benefits of the anchor buoy method of managing the relationship graph, because it's only one of the many methods that have been put forward. And then lastly, how to employ anchor buoy. So that's what we've got in store for ourselves this session. And I do have a, a, a plan to make my portion of it shorter than I have in the past so that we can get to your questions, start to see how to uh, apply anchor buoy uh, in your situations or uh, answer any of your other questions as well. All right, so let's begin with, do we really need a graph management strategy? Uh, take a look at that relationship graph and I think the answer is clear. Oh my goodness, we need a graph management strategy. Yes, it keeps the graph tidy. That will improve clarity and as well, it'll provide a clear path for future expandability. This graph, by the way, not one that I had worked on, fortunately. Uh, a buddy of mine sent it to me. This is a relationship graph for a database solution that originally started with three tables. There were three tables in this system when it began its life. And over time, they always grow, don't they? They always do. Users come up with new ideas, uh, better things that they want to um, have the system do. And so the system just grows and grows. And we've got to make sure that we've got a clear path for expandability. The other reason why we need a graph management strategy may not be quite so intuitively clear, but it's very important as well. And that is that there may exist multiple relational paths between any two entities in a database system. Now, again, we've talked about building entity relationship diagrams. You know that entities are the things or ideas about which you want to store data in a database solution. And so um, what we're saying here is that, you know, from, from entity A to entity B, relationally speaking, there may be more than one way to get there. Now, if, if you're wondering, well, okay, why is that a problem? Well, I like to think of it this way, that a relationship on the relationship graph is like a find. It's like a find that persists, that is baked into the, the schema or the, the DNA of the database. We all know how to perform finds in FileMaker and we end up with a found set of records. Well, building a relationship like this one that I've got pictured is really just like establishing a set of find criteria that is baked into the relationship graph. Here in this case, if we were to start from a record in the animal table, this relationship that we've built right here would let us find the household that that animal lives in or belongs to. And then this relationship right here would let us find all the customers, the other people who live in that same household. So it ends up being a way to find from any given animal, all the people who live in that animal's household. So if you think of a relationship as a find that persists, a lot of things start to make a little bit easier sense. Now, if a relationship is, a, is like a find, then elements that traverse those relational paths, things like portals, calculation functions, and script steps, certain script steps, then they are going to find those related records. They're going to end up with a found set of records when they go from point A on the relational path to point Z. And it follows then that taking a different relational path will lead you to a different set of related records. That's why, uh, that's in my opinion, a strong argument why we need to have a graph management strategy. Let me give you an example. In the animal care clinic solution that we've been building as the sample project in our earlier sessions, there are two relational paths going from animal to customer. Right, here's the ERD we built in our first session and I've highlighted animal and customer. If we were to traverse from animal through household to customer, we would end up finding all the customers who live in the same household as the animal. Whereas if we go from animal through visit to customer, we would end up finding all the customers who had brought that animal in for a visit. 
which would likely be a different subset of customer records than using the first path. Okay, so two different routes between the same two table uh, occurrences or the same two entities would yield a different found set of records there. That's why we need a, a, a management strategy. So if multiple relational paths exist between any two entities, unlike on your entity relationship diagrams, like the one I was just showing you, the relationship graph in FileMaker does not allow closed loops like the one that we had just drawn. It doesn't allow closed loops. We will be forced to create new table occurrences. We will not be able to create that that closed loop on the relationship graph in FileMaker like you could if you were just drawing it out on paper in your ERD. And therefore, that's going to result in many table occurrences on the graph. So it's imperative that we keep the relational paths clear and easy to understand. We need a graph management strategy. I think we're all probably agreed on that. All right. But why use Anchor Buoy? Well, let's talk about the benefits of the anchor buoy method. First of all, it's simple. It's simple to learn and it's simple to employ. Secondly, it's expandable. It leaves plenty of room for future growth. When the system grows, you'll have room for it. It specifies a clear naming scheme that has benefits built right into the naming convention. And lastly, because we separate our TOGs, table occurrence groups. A table occurrence group is the uh, phrase that's been applied to an anchor and her buoys. Okay, Because we separate those table occurrence groups, it makes it easy to specify the right table occurrence when called upon to do so, like when creating a portal. Those are some of the main benefits of using anchor buoy. All right, great. So how do we use it? Well, there are simply uh, there are four simple premises that the anchor buoy method is based upon. If we remember these premises and put them into play, then we'll be using anchor buoy successfully. The first one is for every real table in your system, have a table occurrence on the left hand side of the graph. Now, you know, when you when you first create a table, when you're here in the tables tab of this managed database dialog box and you create a table, FileMaker automatically places a table occurrence for that table on the relationships graph for you. Those are the ones that I find easiest to just, to just kind of move over there onto the left hand side. Okay. Now you're going to want to capitalize their names. That's part of the naming scheme. And the naming scheme is a very important part of anchor buoy. These table occurrences are going to become the anchors. They're, they are your anchors in this anchor buoy metaphor. Okay, so the ones down the left hand sides whose names are in all caps are the anchors. The second premise of anchor buoy. Anytime you need to create a relationship, you're going to string a buoy off of the appropriate anchor. In this instance here, this is an occurrence of the visit table. We can tell that because the, the naming scheme has us putting in capitals the name of the actual table that this is an occurrence of. But we use the whole name of payment underscore visit to define or to make it clear at a glance where this table occurrence is strung off of. What is the anchor that it's buoyed off of? Okay. Thirdly, the third premise, when building layouts, always base your layouts on those anchor table occurrences, never on buoys. Now you might be thinking to yourself, "Uh oh, I've got layouts in my solutions that are based on buoy table occurrences, if you're using anchor buoy at all. Well, <clears throat> it would probably suit you well to go ahead and go in and remedy that go in and fix those. There are two places where we get to assign what table occurrence on the graph a layout is based on. The first occurrence is here when you're making a new layout, right? When you click the new layout report button, you get to specify where do you want this layout to be based on, on, on what table occurrence on the graph should it be bound to, okay? And you'll always wanna choose one of the capital ones, always one of the anchors, never a buoy. The second place where you'll see this opportunity to specify the table occurrence that a layout is based on is here in the layout setup dialog box. 
in layout setup, if you have an existing layout and you need to change the table occurrence that it's based on, this is where you do it here. And once again, if you're going to follow anchor buoy to the letter, you'll want to only choose the ones that are capitalized here. Never a buoy, only an anchor. Any questions on that so far? Okay, fantastic. The fourth and final premise of anchor buoy is that you never connect an anchor to another anchor, right? Between material and vendor, I've got those two anchors connected. Never do that. That violates the anchor buoy method as well. And it you lose a lot of the benefits. You wanna make sure that you keep those table occurrence groups disconnected from the other table occurrence groups. Otherwise, it will end up looking like all your table occurrences are related to each other and you'll lose a lot of that benefit that we were just talking about. All right, so there's how you use anchor buoy. Now, are there any drawbacks to the anchor buoy method? Well, yes, I, you, potentially. The relationship graph of necessity is going to include multiple table occurrences of the same real table. So there will be a, a, a seeming redundancy Right, you'll have a table occurrence for each one of your real tables down the left hand side as the anchors, but then you'll have buoys of some of those same table occurrences. Sorry, you have buoys which are occurrences of some of those same tables here to create your relationships. However, the drawbacks there are far outweighed by the benefits. That is, that when you're specifying a table occurrence, it's easy to see only the other table occurrences that are related to the current table, to the current context. Like here, when you're building a portal, right? Show records from what table occurrence, from what relationship in this portal, starting from current table visit, it's very easy to see that only these table occurrences are available to you. These are the only ones that are connected to the current table to visit. All of the unrelated table occurrences sink down into this no man's land of unrelated tables. So they're gray, they're not even not even choosable, not even selectable. So anchor buoy, it's not the only relationship graph management method, but it's certainly the most widely used one. In fact, it's, it provides the, the basis of uh, another graph management strategy that's become very popular of late called the selector connector method that we'll talk about in a future session. Um, anchor buoy is still kind of even at the heart of that one, even though that one is uh, much more modern. So let's start to put this anchor buoy method into play. <clears throat> I'm going to switch over into FileMaker. And here's where we left our animal care database in the last session. Ah, I've got a, a chat message. Doesn't anchor buoy eliminate the basic virtue? of FileMaker by directionality. So Lynn, I would argue that by directionality isn't necessarily a virtue. Um, you, you can argue that, yes, that the, your anchor buoy method is always flowing from left to right. That would certainly be a valid argument. That's true. Um, but the by directionality, I think, of our relationships gets people, a lot of people, into trouble in their graph management. And you end up with, oftentimes, when you're using, when you're taking advantage of that bi-directionality of your relationships, you um, find your graph quickly growing into a, an un, like an untended garden, and it, it can become unwieldy at a certain size, at a certain point. So, yes, I'll agree with you that bi-directionality uh, is not taken advantage of in the anchor buoy method. I don't miss it. I don't miss it. And the, the vast majority of other FileMaker developers do employ the anchor buoy method as well. And so um, I would argue that they probably don't miss it either. Great question though, great point. Okay, so again, here we left, here's where we left our animal care uh, file. And I'm just gonna have us take a quick look at the relationship graph. And we see, yikes, we've got crisscrossing relationship paths here, even though we've only built a handful of relationships. But, you know, if we move one of these around, we can see that 
it's strung to various locations. Likewise, this one, not that that's a bad thing, but it's just starting to get a little bit clumsy, a little awkward and ugly, hard to track the relational paths visually. So I'll cancel out of there. And during the, uh, the time between our last session and this one, I created another version of the file. This is the one, by the way, that I made available to you via email uh, when I sent the reminder. And all I've done to the relationship graph here in this one is I've accomplished that first premise of the anchor buoy method where I moved the anchors to all down the left-hand side. You can see here, I've simply rearranged the table occurrences so that all of the anchor table occurrences or the ones that we are self-declaring as anchors are down the left-hand side. I left all the relationships the healthy ones and the unhealthy ones like this one here that's violating the the premise that says do not connect one anchor to another but we'll go in and remedy those here in this session right now and some of the others that were also still healthy like this self join that we created last time between a visit and a visit and all the other visits of the same animal or between visit and all the services that we provide that's using the cross product join, also known as the Cartesian join that we learned last time. So I left those as well, but we've got a few here as I move this around, you can see we've got a few anchors tied to other anchors and those will need to break. Now, if you break a relationship on the graph, you've also broken anything that was dependent upon that relationship, like portals, calculations, script steps, Anything that was dependent upon that relationship, you will then need to go and repair because it'll be broken. But I'll do that here again also as you watch. Now, I generally like to let the layouts be my guide as to um, what work needs to be done. So I'm going to go to layout mode. There we go. And here on layout number one, we have no portals, nothing that needs relationship. I'll move on to the next. That relationship is one of the ones that was um, still intact that doesn't need to be broken. Go to the next and it's on layout number four where we come to the first portals that are going to get broken as soon as I start to, um, to patch up those bad relationships. So this first one here is starting from household going to customer. That is all the folks who live in the current household. All right, so I'll go to the relationship graph and this relationship right here between household and customer, that one, I'm gonna break it and then rebuild it. So hitting the backspace or delete key on the keyboard to sever that relationship so that it's not one anchor connected to another anchor, right? That violated premise number four of, of anchor buoy. And I wanna put an, another instance of the customer table right over here as a buoy strung off of household. You can do that two ways. You can use this button here to add a new table occurrence, choosing the proper table, the, the desired table. And then the naming scheme of anchor buoy says, leave the, the name of the real table that this occurrence is based on, leave it in all caps, but then prefix it with the name of the anchor that it's strung off of. So I'm gonna put household and then an underscore just as a decorative character there, preceding customer, okay? Household underscore customer. The name therefore provides a really clear path, almost as if we're giving directions to ourselves and the, the people who inherit this database from us saying this table occurrence is an occurrence of customer that is strung off of household. I'll click OK, position that where we want it, widen it out a little bit and create the relationship between ID household to ID in household. There, better. Now again, as I click OK, I just broke this portal because this portal used to be based on the relationship between household and customer. And now as I double click on it, you see it doesn't know what it's based on. 
because that relationship line, I deleted it. So we just need to go in and patch that up. Double clicking on the dark part of the portal, of course, took us into portal setup. And we see that, well, from household, these are the only two table occurrences on the graph that have a connection, have a relationship to it. Household customer, we just built it, is the right choice there. That is starting from household, the table occurrence that this layout is based on, and pointing to customer. You see how the name here in the anchor buoy method spells out perfectly clearly the starting point and ending point of any particular table occurrence. I love it. Yes, the names do get long, but that's just an important part of it. Hey, Tim. Yeah, Julie. Does it make a, I think I'm doing them backwards. Does that make a difference? Mine would have been customer underscore household. Well, I would, I would be confused by that name if applied to this, this table occurrence right here, because the naming scheme is supposed to guide us almost like um, turn by turn directions, right? So th this name says, hey, starting at an occurrence of the household table, go to the customer table, like, a, like you were giving directions to a friend to a, a favorite destination. Yeah, I think that's where part of my problem is, is I think I'm going backwards because I'm thinking I need the customer. So I'm taking the customer, pulling it from a household. So I think I'm doing them backwards and I think that might be part of my problems. Well, I th it sounds like you're thinking about it correctly. If I understood you just there, you're just naming it backwards from what the traditional anchor buoy method would say to do. If you treat these like directions, like paths, saying, okay, you know, start here, turn left here, go three blocks, turn right here, and so forth. That's what these names are supposed to kind of feel like, like turn by turn directions. Okay. All right, great question, thank you. Now, patching up that portal, this can get you into trouble. Patching up that portal as I just did and changing the, the relationship on which it's based, did not fix the fields that are within it, did not automatically uh, adjust those fields to point down the right relationship line. In fact, I'll prove it to you. As I exit out of layout mode, you're gonna see a whole lot of nothing in this portal. Well, worse than nothing, <laughs> unrelated fields, unrelated tables. So that's a good reminder. Oh yeah, once you change the direction of the portal, you also then need to do the same thing with the fields. I'll double click on that name first field and this is really easy. All you need to do is remember, okay, what am I pointing to? I'm trying to show customer data. And the new way to do that is household customer, right? That's the new table occurrence. Fortunately, because they're based on the same table, the old, the old table occurrence and the new, the field doesn't become deselected. It'll stay selected. And so all you need to do is choose the correct table occurrence, the correct relational path, and then click OK. We'll do it again with name last, double clicking on the name last field, choosing the appropriate relational path or table occurrence and click OK. There we go. We'll get much better results now. There we are. So in that household, me and Chris and Cole, next household, just Robin and so on. All right, the next portal that needs repair here or the next relationship is this one between household and animal. Household and animal at present is violating our premises of the anchor buoy method because it's connecting an anchor to another anchor. So this relationship has got to go. Clicking once on the relationship, I'll hit the backspace or delete key, it's gone. And now I need to create another table occurrence of animal and put it right up here I'll give, give myself a little room, put it right up here and string it off of household. The last time we created a new table occurrence, I used this button here. This time, instead, I'm gonna use a keyboard shortcut. On the Mac, I'm gonna use the option key. If you're on a Windows machine, you'll use the control key. And you simply hold that key down as you drag an occurrence of the table that you want. So animal, and I'm holding down the option key or the control key on a PC and you get another occurrence of that same table. It's just a shortcut, but it's a wonderful one. Option drag or control drag, it's called making a drag copy. 
Then to change the title, double click on the title bar. It's already based on the right table, so I don't have to change that at all, but I do want to change the name coming down here and following that same naming convention of preceding the name of the table with the name of the anchor table to which it's going to be buoyed. So household underscore animal, leaving animal in all caps to remind me this is an occurrence of animal, but that's strung off of household, that's related to household. Okay, ID household to ID in household, and there we've got our new relationship. In the same way, I'll then go back and, and patch up that portal. But any questions on what we just did there? Okay, fantastic. Double clicking on the portal here will let us patch this up. We say, well, it meant we, we now need it to be based on this relationship, household animal or household to animal might be a better way to, to say that if you're speaking it out loud. And then we've got to go and patch up each of those fields to point them down the right relational path as well. Double clicking on the animal name field and we're going to draw that from household animal because animal at this point now has sunk down into the unrelated tables section, right? There's no, there's no join, there's no connection between where we are now and this table occurrence on the graph. But we do have this, there's the new relationship that we just constructed. Fantastic, I'll do the same with the ID genus field, point it down the household animal relationship and exit and save. And we should see now for any given household, their various animals. All right, any questions on those first couple of fixes? Okay, let's take a look at the next layout. On layout number five, there's this relationship between our material table and the vendor table. And this was a special one. We wanted to show all vendors. So we used a cross product join on this relationship. A cross product join means every record in the starting table is related to every record in the ending table of that relational chain. We'll go to manage database and you think, well, what's wrong with this relationship? Only that it is between two anchors. It's, it's right here, right? Material to vendor right there. It's that guy right there. We can't join two anchors that violates the anchor buoy strategy. So I'm gonna delete that relationship and I'll recreate it using an anchor and a buoy of vendor. Holding down the option key, dragging a copy of vendor over to the right, giving it a better name. Now, again, this was a kind of a specialty relationship where we were trying to show all vendors. We're using a cross product join here that I'll have to re-implement. And so in specialty relationships, you're welcome to add a little bit of description at the end of the table occurrence name to remind you why you built this relationship or what's unique about it. If it's, if it's not just a primary key to foreign key kind of relationship, and I'll say something like, you know, all vendors, just to remind myself, oh yeah, we built this relationship for the purpose of being able to show a list of all of the vendors that we deal with whenever we're looking at any record in the material table. And this relationship being a cross product join, it doesn't matter which fields we use. So I'm just gonna go ahead and go ID to ID and then double clicking on that relationship will change the operator to the cross product operator, the Cartesian join, click change, click okay. There we go. We'll say okay here. Any questions on that by the way? Okay, wonderful. And like before, we'll need to patch up our portal. Double clicking on the dark part of the portal. Let's just specify the new and proper relational path. And then likewise, don't forget to change the fields one by one, double click on every field in that portal and point it down the right relational path. Double click. Now 
There we go. And to test this out, let's see that, yes, indeed, no matter what material record we're on, we still get a list of all three of our vendors. Okay, wonderful. Working quickly through the other layouts, I already patched up the relationships on uh, layout 11 here. I fixed that one up already. And on 12, I patched those up already just so we wouldn't be doing overly redundant work here during our session together. But there is a problem on this layout and it's this value list attached to the ID animal field. This was a special value list we built last time when we were talking about um, how, to, how to build complex relationships. This was a filtered value list called animals in household by visit. You see what we wanted to have here was we wanted this value list to show all the animals that live in the same household as the customer who is visiting us right now. So that when we schedule a visit for customer X, we can easily choose which animal by only seeing the animals that live in that customer's household, rather than all the hundreds and hundreds of animals that, that will eventually be in our animal table as records. At this point, this relationship has broken because I, I snapped one of, its, one of its branches. I broke one of its branches when we were fixing up one of those earlier relationships. So we're gonna ha have to go and repatch that relationship as well. We'll go back into the graph. And again, this was starting at visit. We're on the visit desktop layout. So I'll come down here and see that there, starting from visit, ay, 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 we've got this illegal relationship here because it's joining an anchor to another anchor. Uh, instead, we're going to break that relationship and then go customer, <clears throat> excuse me, from visit through customer, through household to animal to create the four chains of that relationship that are needed in order to produce the desired filtered value list. That's the relationship that we had before. It was going visit to customer to household and then to animal. But you saw me as I snapped both of those last two relationships just in this session just a few moments ago. And so now we'll break the last one of them here Boom, done. And then we'll put an instance of customer right down in this area here. Let me give myself a little more room. There we go. All right, what should I call this table occurrence? If it's gonna be buoyed off of the anchor called visit, what should I call it? How visit about that? Visit customer. Visit customer. Visit underscore customer. Exactly. Yeah. I wasn't trying to trick you. I'm just kind of trying to keep you engaged. All right. Good. Visit underscore customer. We'll say OK. And then that is going to be related via customer ID, right? We've got a customer who's requesting the, the visit for their animal. And so we've got ID as a foreign key here. ID customer, sorry, as a foreign key in visit, needing to connect to the primary key of that customer here ID. Then the next leg of this, um, this relational path is going to go to through household. So again, uh, that's pretty far up. Maybe I'll just use this approach instead, add a table, a table occurrence of household. And now what should I call this one? The path is getting longer. All right, Jeff's got it in the chat. Fantastic, Jeff, well done. Visit underscore customer underscore household. And notice the lowercase versus the uppercase. Well done, outstanding. I'll say okay there. Uh, what did I do wrong? Sorry, cancel. Do I have, oh, I've got a space at the end that I didn't see. Sorry about that, All right? There we go. there and so a household and an id household foreign key here matching up with primary key here fantastic and then lastly all the animals that belong to any given household will be the last step in this chain the last stop on the tour 
And this one is going to be, is it underscore customer underscore, <laughs> Jeff's got it again, outstanding, household underscore animal. Now, again, please don't be put off by the long names. You know, if I were giving you directions to my favorite restaurant down here, I wouldn't leave out a stop. I wouldn't leave out a turn just because it was so the directions were getting too long. These directional names are really useful, really important. I know it makes us want to stretch these things out. And all right, so what? There. ID household here, foreign key to ID in household, primary key. Bing, bang, boom. We've got our relational chain. All right, any questions or concerns on that? Okay. Why don't we talk through it? From any one visit record, that visit was scheduled by a customer. This relationship right here will let us figure out which customer that is. It will find that customer because of the matching ID numbers. So at this point along the, the chain now or along the path, we will have discerned which customer scheduled the visit. Then this part of the path says, okay, for that customer, which household do they live in, right? Notice the many to one, meaning it's only gonna find one household that that customer lives in. Again, perfectly right and reasonable. And then lastly, this relationship will find the, and notice the many symbol on this side, will find the many animals that are tagged as belonging to that household by virtue of their ID household, their foreign key value there. So from a visit, we can find the animals that belong to the customer or to the household of the customer who scheduled that visit. Whew. I think that has successfully made it so that we have no more anchors connected to other anchors. Looking just quickly down, yes, that's true. We have no more anchors connected to other anchors. Now our graph finally is in good, true anchor buoy form. Lynn asks, would you ever include the key field in the table occurrence name as part of your naming convention? Hmm, good question. I don't, my personal habit is to, um, to not include the name of the field like uh, visit customer via customer ID or something like that. I've certainly seen that done um, I don't do it because you can just look at the relationship graph and see that marked out really clearly on the graph. I wouldn't argue with somebody for doing it if they want their names to be even more informative, right? Loaded with even more information. Um, I, I just don't find it necessary. And besides, I sleep with my ERD under my pillow. So I could just look at the ERD and, and know what fields that relationship is going to be based on, right? So that's, that's, my, that's my opinion on that. Again, wonderful question, Lynn, thank you. I'll click okay here. That didn't fix the relationship because the, the, um, the value list is still buggered up. It's still pointing now to a, a, a table occurrence that has no relationship to visit. So we've got to go now and fix up the value list. I think I might've said that wrong. The value list is based on a broken relationship. Here it is. We'll jump into it, specify field. And so again, we are gonna, we're gonna be planning on using this value list from a context that starts at visit. And so this choice here needs to be a table occurrence that starts with visit and ends at animal right? We're trying to see all the animals that relate to the current visit. So we're looking here to choose a, a relational path that starts at visit and ends at animal. And here it is. Here's the one, here's the chain that we just created, right? That, that path represents four table occurrences on the graph, starting from a visit record, go and find that visit's customer, then go and find that customer's household, then go and find that household's animals. Now, if you're thinking, hey, Tim, you just broke one of your own rules about always only choosing anchors. Uh, that rule only applied to layouts. It doesn't apply to filtered value lists. In fact, 
you must choose a buoy if you're trying to create a filtered or what you call a relational value list. You must choose a buoy because as soon as you come down here and say, hey, I want this to be just filtered. I don't want all animals. I only want the animals that belong to the household of the customer who scheduled the current visit. When you make this choice, which turns it into a filtered value list, you then have the responsibility of choosing. I'll show this whole menu so you see, how, see the options and how beautifully the undesirable options drop out of view, right? Only the desirable options appear. And these are only those table occurrences that are connected in some way to this table occurrence. These are all the ones in that same, and I'll use the abbreviation that you saw in my earlier slides, TOG, table occurrence group. You'll read that, that um, acronym all over the place in the FileMaker forums. So I want you to be familiar with it. A TOG is a table occurrence group that is, in fact, let me just jump quickly into manage database. A TOG, this would be considered a TOG, an anchor and her buoys, right? Now the, the TOG, the table occurrence group in question for us is this one right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six table occurrences in that table occurrence group. Okay, good. So if we look here, there ought to be one, two, three, four, five, because of course it doesn't use, it doesn't include this one. So you see what I mean? These are just those that are in the same table occurrence group, these five, as this one is. And here we're gonna choose the head or the anchor. Oh, sorry, duh, what am I thinking? Sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Here, we're gonna choose the head of that, that uh, path, the trailhead, if you will, of that path, saying, starting from the current visit record, traverse this relational path, which will take you to all of the animals that are related to that visit. We'll leave the fields chosen as they were, ID and animal name. Everything else looks good. Okay, questions? Wonderful, we'll say okay and okay again and okay again. And there, our relationship now is in, is in good shape, it's healthy. And our drop-down menu, or sorry, pop-up menu can now show us successfully the animals that belong to the household of the current customer. Let me get over to a, a customer who has lots of animals. There we go. Bill and Tracy Jones have three animals and there they all are. All right, so success, it worked great. So that's how you can employ Anchor Bowie.